This is a conventional supply, uh, uh, supply network. Kraft has those big blue distribution centers, uh, big green distribution centers. They're geographically spread out. And this is what space tends to look like if you're a supply chain person. You sort of say, okay, we're going to you know, average out population density and road quality, and here we go, here's where we put our warehouses. This is how Amazon does it. They cluster. Nobody's ever built a, demand, a supply network like this before. Let's zoom in a little bit. Here's Pennsylvania. There's 11 fulfillment centers in Pennsylvania. They're not geographically spread out. They're clustered around major um, road junctions. They're not really all that close to cities. You notice that there are 11 on the other chart. If you were counting, there's only nine on the map because two of them are basically doubled up. They're on the corner from each other, basically. They're, they're one peg represents two days uh, fulfillment centers. Nobody's ever built a network like this before. And so we're in the middle of it. This is what an algorithmically driven, advanced, heavily robotic demand chain, supply chain looks like. What are the barriers? We obviously talk about the future and how exciting this all is, and there's a lot of good stuff happening. Our infrastructure is not ready for it. Legally, what are my rights as a manufacturer? If I'm CAT, if I'm GE, if I, if I make something and you can scan it and make a copy of it, what are the, do we do like we do now with color printers? We put a little, uh, a little speck in so you cannot color print money as a counterfeiter? Do we have the equivalent bit that we put into 3D printing machines so you can't copy certain kinds of materials? Our physical infrastructure, we talked a lot about autonomous vehicles. What happens when an autonomous vehicle has to choose between a pothole and a bicycle? And then the cultural infrastructure, and which Salim talked about, right? What are the rights to privacy? What are the rights to an income? What are the rights to work? And supply chains are very much wrapped up in this. Because supply chains, factory work, logistics work, warehouse work, have often provided entry-level employment for people with low educational attainment, for veterans, for a lot of other people like that. What happens when this gets automated and you get much, many more robotics, many more autonomous uh, entities, a lot more algorithmic optimizations. Another barrier is complexity and speed. The margin for error at Tesla, Elon Musk got up and said, hey, we only had a part shortage of six out of 8,000 pieces. Six out of 8,000, that's a great batting average. It still stopped the line. So you have zero margin for error, and many of you who work in manufacturing know this, and it's sort of pedestrian, and it's sort of uh, not glamorous like CRISPR, but the fact is you're talking about tiny margins of error and a lot of very, very hard execution to get a car out the door that's safe, that's reliable, that's predictable, that's able to be maintained. It's not easy. Talent is going to be a huge issue, and I know many companies in the room are wrestling with this. We have an online master's in supply chain. I've seen students from GE. I've seen students from Caterpillar. I have graduates working at Deloitte. And so the human capital question is really pressing. There are not enough good people out there. And finally, the growing pains. What are we going to do as we go from the old regime to the new regime? What will be the unexpected consequences that trip us up? What are the unknown unknowns? 